for today, as well as broader trends in the region. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Matinia, for joining us. Uh, if we were in a lecture hall, I would uh, ask for a round of applause. Um, but since we're online, I'll just um, hand over the word to you. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to the lecture. Thank you very much, Matthias. I uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity, the invitation to uh, interact with you and your colleagues on this important topic. And um, I'm encouraged, you know, as well to see your interest in, uh, in this topic as it occurs in the continent. So what I'm going to do now is to share my screen so that um, you can uh, view the presentation as I go, I, I go through it. Shall we do that? Yes, of course. Um, take just a second to set up. Okay, can you all see the screen, the presentation? Yes, I believe so. Yes, Wonderful. Wonderful. So the presentation is radicalization by design, and I will explain the reasons for which I've, I've entitled it uh, radicalization by design. The rise of violent extremism in northern Mozambique, and this is mostly, well, so far it's been um, uh, violent extremism associated with the Islamic religion in northern Mozambique in the province of Cabo Delgado the northernmost province which borders Tanzania. So you, you may be already aware of the group of local young men armed with firearms and machetes who staged a two day attack in Mosimba the Praia on the 5th of October, 2017. Musimba da Praia is a district in the north of Cap Delgado. It's the district you find before you find Palma district, which you know, borders Tanzania through the Rovuma River. These attackers, this group of young men targeted police stations and government buildings. And 17 people were killed. <clears throat> Among them, 14 insurgents, members of the group, two policemen and one civilian. And when this happened, the government forces scrambled to regain the town for two days. And the government at the same time des described the attack as an isolated incident, claiming to have everything under control. However, in reality, the government was scrambling to take over the town, to regain the town. It was not under you know, the government control. And that took two days. It soon became clear that the group was a new one to be reckoned with in the history of Mozambican uh, political struggles. And with more attacks, with more experience, with more capture of government, arms and vehicles, the group became more sophisticated and it became stronger. And so far, the ACLED reports as of 6 of November, that we have a total of organized violence events, 661 since October the 5th, 2017. And we have 2,193 dead already, half of whom are civilians. And we have more than 700,000 in need of humanitarian assistance. Thousands of international displaced people arrive every week in Pemba, which is the capital city of Cap Delgado, 
while others actually don't make it there. They die on the way, either in the, in the jungle or in the sea when the boats in which they travel capsize because of the precariousness of these uh, canoes and ships and because of overloads. And these attacks have also occurred, about three of them, in Tanzania last month. So as you see, those are the beginnings of the, of the spread of these violent attacks. And the first neighboring country to experience that expansion is Tanzania. This group in Mozambique is locally known as Al-Shabaab. In fact, if you go to Cap Delgado, and if you're lucky enough to go to the conflict zone, people will tell you that this is Al-Shabaab, but there's no connection with Al-Shabaab in, in, uh, in Somalia. The military also calls the group Al-Shabaab, the population, and the police call the group Al-Shabaab. That's the name that you will hear when you're there and you speak with people. And uh, last year, ISIS, since last year, ISIS has been claiming the group's attacks. This followed the, the group's swearing of allegiance to ISIS. ISIS has also been publishing the group's attacks, uh, which gives the group you know, international profile and prestige exposure and also to make their grievances heard. The group leaders have come out and masked you know, to say what they are fighting for and what they are fighting against. And in March this year, when they launched a series of attacks against government positions uh, in the Northern districts, one of their leaders you know, came out openly, he wasn't masked and uh, he said that they were occupying the towns to show that the government of the day is unfair, that the government humiliates the poor and gives profits to the bosses. Now, the bosses, this refers to the political elite, many of whom are based in Maputo. In fact, you could say the majority of whom are based in Maputo, about um, 2,500 kilometers away, and that's where decisions are made. He also claimed that they are fighting for a government based on Sharia law, Islamic government, not a government of unbelievers or infidels. So the ongoing violence in Northern Mozambique, I argue that must be located within the economic, social and political designs of Mozambique. The first one is extremist political structures. The party in Mozambique is the state and the state is the party. And we are talking about the ruling party at the moment, which is Frelimo. There is no distinction between the nation, between the state and the party. They are all one and the same thing in the way they are configured. That's an extreme political arrangement in Mozambique which occupies the entire political space at the exclusion of other political forces, particularly the opposition. There's a complete and total partisanization of public service. There's this expression called politicization of public service. What I'm talking about here is more extreme than politicization. What I'm referring to here is partisanization of the public service. In other words, the ruling political party monopolizes the entire public service so that if one intends to apply for strategic jobs in public service, they have to be members 
of the ruling party. Otherwise, they will be excluded. Even at the lowest level, you find this phenomenon of partisanization of public service. Teachers, nurses, even in the military, you find that there is an extreme partisanization of the services. This increasing political intoler intolerance and extreme, extreme political views. Uh, you may recall that in the past 10 years or so, there have been you know, killings that are politically motivated, mostly targeting people who hold um, contradictory views to the views of the government, people who have critical views on the government of the day. And this has been happening. There's been uh, what they call the death squad that killed a lot of people belonging to the opposition. It had stopped for a couple of years, but there are reports to the effect that, you know, these death squad is being revived in, to continue the work that has been doing in the past. Now, as I was telling you, the political elite have centralized their power in Mozambique, 2,500 kilometers away from Cap Delgado. That's where most decisions are made. And in central, in northern Mozambique, in fact, anywhere that is not Maputo, they only have to take marching orders uh, made in Maputo, far away. The majority of the population uh, is concentrated in northern regions. So in central and northern Mozambique, which is the stronghold of the, of the opposition, uh, Mozambique has repeatedly lost elections in those areas. However, with the winner takes all you know, type of politics, even in places where the ruling party has been losing elections, got to appoint uh, governors for provinces. And this is what has been happening since in independence. For the first time, Mozambique had elections for governors, but um, that does not accomplish the purposes that you know the reforms had in mind. Because while the law on decentralization of government was put in place, on the other hand, that law was nullified or rendered futile by the decision to install what they call uh, secretaries of state who now have more power than elected officials, provincial governors. So you still have the opposition excluded from the decisions that matter to the country. Those are politics of extremes that have structured you know, Mozambique as we know it since independence. We also have extreme socioeconomics. The Northern regions are rich in natural resources. In fact, they are the richest in the country in terms of concentration of natural resources. But at the same time, these regions socioeconomically, they are the poorest. They have the poorest social economic indicators. They consistently rank, uh, rank very low in terms of um, human development index, particularly in Cap Delgado. The poorest health facilities, poorest schools, the poorest sanitation, high unemployment, notably for youth, and poorest infrastructure. The province ranks at the bottom, if not of all of the indicators, but most of them in human development indicators, despite the fact that you know, the province is rich in natural resources. 
So you have this large population in the north with large wealth in terms of natural resources. But paradoxically, these are the poorest areas in terms of all the you know, social and economic indicators that you can think of. Now, what you see on the map here is Cabo Delgado. Uh, so if you follow my cursor, I will show you the province of Cabo Delgado. This is it. This is all Cabo Delgado. And as you can see, uh, these, these squares and triangles that you see on the map, these are areas designated for mining and mining exploration, research and so on. They already belong to someone. Many of them belong to the elite based in Maputo, who then sell them or enter into partnership with multinational corporations that are interested in mining. And as you can see, there's little land left for agriculture, for people to grow their food, for people to access water, and for people to access basically all their means of subsistence. All this land now has been licensed or belongs already to mining companies, multinational corporations, and the political elite based in Muzam in Maputo. This is extreme. <clears throat> now, I was saying the human development indicators. In 2009, the illiteracy rate in Cabo Delgado was 70% versus the national average, which was 43%. In 2015, there was an improvement over the years since 2019. So that illiteracy rate in Cabo Delgado was 61% against the national average of 45%. In Cabo Delgado, there was the highest rate of children and youth between five and 25 without attending school. That was 35% compared to the rest of the provinces. 12% of households uh, had electricity for lighting. So only 12% had access to electricity for lights as we have here and you know, use it uh, to access internet and so on. And 67 to 12 uh, and 12% 12 of households used batteries and firewood for light respectively. And the province had the highest rate of families headed by men and women whose occupation was peasantry <clears throat> without using the word derogatorily, but um, that means people who rely on the land and farming for their subsistence, subsistence agriculture. And in the province, this widespread child marriage, notably in the Northern districts, where the extremist violence is taking place. So you see all of these, these correlations between extreme politics and extreme socioeconomics. <clears throat> now, the population of the region is known as the Mwani and the Makua. And these together form the majority, 67%. And they are predominantly Muslim and they live along the coast. Many of them, uh, in addition to agriculture, also practice fishing for their subsistence. You also have the Makonde, who constitute about 22%. And these are predominantly Christian and they live in the plateau. And uh, this is a rural, it's a rural district. It's a rural uh, province. And, and the northern parts of 
the of the province are deeply rural and with entrenched traditional social cultural practices and there are early early marriage is common polygamy is also common and you have large families with a lack of or limited access to schools hospitals water and sanitation as well as telecommunications few old and precarious roads and bridges which makes makes it very difficult for people to travel and trade their goods in the provincial markets so this infrastructure roads and bridges have been built they were built in the colonial era before independence mozambique became independent in 1975 and many of them have existed post independence for 45 years without maintenance so they're in precarious conditions some bridges have collapsed uh, during rainy seasons particularly in in um, uh, in the year when we had cyclone Kenneth followed by heavy rains some of these bridges have collapsed which aggravated the, the, the problem of movement of people in the area so for five years you had an absent government no effective public administration to provide services no infrastructure built since colonial times no schools hospitals water and sanitation people relied on the land and on each other the natural ecosystem around them to provide for themselves in terms of food farmland fishing grazing for their livestock wild food for access to water rivers and lakes for education they relied on mosques and islamic schools in their communities and they relied on medicinal plants and traditional doctors and you also had people relying for their construction or housing needs on the natural ecosystem around them the construction material is from the land and that's how things have been for centuries and 45 years of independence haven't changed much of that however in the past 10 years or so the discovery of natural resources mineral resources in particular um, rubies graphite gold natural gas uh, have made the region very attractive not only to the government but to international multinational corporations interested in these mineral resources so 45 years later the government the absentee government comes to the region attracted by these natural resources but it does not come in peace it does not come in peace bringing schools hospitals water sanitation bridges and roads and all the services that the people need in the area instead the government comes in aggression to take away the only thing that makes life possible and worth living and that is the land and as you've seen in that uh, map most of the land has been licensed by the government uh, to private individuals and mining companies as if that were not enough these mining companies do not employ local labor they employ imported labor because as the argument goes locals lack skills to work in the growing extractive industry to work in the mines uh, to work uh, in the oil and gas industry that is growing in palma district because the argument is that people in this area have had no education have had no skills for such a long time and so they cannot be employed so what happens is 
locals, especially the youth who dream of a bright future, watch others who come from elsewhere enjoy the wealth that they themselves believe should be theirs to enjoy. And uh, it's been a vicious cycle. And so what you see are these local grievances that have been brewing for such a long time and there's no resolution in sight. There are no solutions in sight. What you continue to see is politics of extremism, of exclusion, socioeconomics of extremism and exclusion that are taking place in the area. And so when the radical preachers come comes to the area or comes to town, really what he has to do is simply say to, to these young people without skills, without education, at least formal education, uh, unemployed and unemployable, he just comes in and says to them, for all the loyalty that you have for your government, based in Maputo, far away from here, what do you have to show for it? Nothing. And that way it's easier for young people who see bleakness in their future, join these organizations. There have been reports again and again of young people who have been given sums of money in exchange for them joining the organizations and uh, recruiting others to join. So while the government argues that there are external forces motivating or enticing young people to join the, the armed group and driving the violent extremism in Northern Mozambique, in reality, the violence in Northern Mozambique is driven by local grievances. The radicalization of young people is by design. I would say most of radicalization of young people in Mozambique is committed or driven by local grievances, is driven by governance issues, is driven by inequality, is driven by how the government conducts itself in the region in terms of governance. Who gets what, when, and how. That's where most of the radicalization happens. The radical preacher who comes from elsewhere simply comes to, um, to harvest what has been created for him by local grievances, by the conduct of the government. This is how the, the violent extremism in Northern Mozambique should be understood. This is what we see as we conduct research as we follow the events, as we monitor the situation of the ongoing human rights conditions in Northern Cabo Delgado. This is our conclusion so far. And uh, it's not definitive, but uh, this is what we see when we analyze the situation in Northern Cabo Delgado. Now, as I said at the beginning, Tanzania is one, it is the first country to experience expansion of this violence. While it begins in Mozambique, it has expanded somewhat to Southern Tanzania. And the conditions for this expansion exist all over this region in Southern Africa. Youth unemploy unemployment is a huge human security problem here. In fact, one could argue that um, poor governance, who gets what, when, and how, is the biggest 
human security problem is the biggest driver of disenchantment and um, disaffection, anger and alienation of young people who could easily be recruited into the ranks of these violent extremist armed, armed groups. So that's the argument that I would like to make this evening, the central argument that I would like to make this evening to you. There's so much happening in the region and um, we'll take it from your questions and commentaries. And um, yes, this is it. Let's um, have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... That's a very good, very comprehensive uh, overview. Um, and yeah, um, that was very interesting to see. I um, saw some trends which uh, overlap with what I've noticed in um, other uh, regions of the continent, which I'd hope to point out with uh, uh, Dr. Sila essentially of uh, what you described is a, a common pattern to w what draws um, violent extremists uh, or youth to turn to these alternative means of uh, yeah finding an income essentially if you look at uh, nigeria it's the northeast provinces uh, near the border with chad and cameroon um, because near lake chad there's a lack of government control if you look at the current insurgencies in Burkina Faso and Mali and Niger, it's in, during, in the interpoint between those borders where there's again a lack of government investment, oversight, interests, and mostly just resource extraction. Um, and again, in most other areas where there's just a lack of government oversight, lack of investment um, in Somalia and Libya as well, because in those countries have for a while, for a long time, not had a functioning government. Um, they have a very similar pattern, I would say. Um, mm. Do you think it's, just, just to start off with the discussion, do you think it's um, that all these uh, outside parties are coming in to claim attacks um, because uh, of innate um, grievances of the population? Or do these outside influences as the Mozambican government would claim um, influence local uh, people who have these grievances to act. Um, which, which comes first, the, the Al-Qaeda or Islamic State influence or is it the local uh, youth who have their, their grievances? Well, um, in response to that, the first thing that uh one must keep in mind is that the argument that it's external influence, it's ISIS that drives violence in Africa, um, absolves the government from, you know, misgoverning the continent. It excuses the government. It externalizes the blame to others outside of the continent, rather than taking the responsibility for their actions. I'm talking about the governments. Because what you see in all these countries that you have cited, one key issue is government absenteeism, lack of effective administration, marginalization of people. So there's a vacuum that is left there. And what happens is people lack access to services, which further marginalizes them. So if, if you're marginalized because you, have, you, you, you don't have access to education, for instance, it's the responsibility of the government to ensure that all its citizens have access to education. So if you're marginalized because you lack access to education, whose responsibility is it? to ensure that everybody has, has access to education. In order for you to become integrated in the economy, in the labor market, you have to close that gap. You have to access education. You have to access 
uh, institutions that impart skills to young people, which is something that we barely see in these areas where you have government absenteeism. It's a vacuum. So these young people are marginalized. There's no bright future as you would have in areas, especially in towns, big cities, where people have access to education. They are marginalized. Even when you have, you know, the so-called foreign direct, direct investment, it's not helpful to people because they cannot be absorbed into the, the labor force. So these are all you know, similarities that we see. These are results of poor governance by governments. And now you know, it's convenient for them to say, you know, these attacks, uh, the uprisings are driven by external forces, by ISIS. And by making that claim, they also uh, gain sympathy from Western countries, most of them donors, to attract you know, donor funds, to fund their military, to fund you know, their government. And corruption and lack of accountability, basically, that's what you get. So I find this argument of pointing fingers at ISIS very shaky. I find it uh, problematic because really, if you had young people included economically, politically, socially, if you had young people optimistic about their future, bright futures, then ISIS would have little influence here. Because as you were saying, they are looking for means of making an income. And ISIS tends to say to them, we're gonna give you a means to make an income. And in Mozambique, they've distributed some funds, you know, to entice young people and to get others to recruit more young people to replenish their ranks. And I see there's a question here. Um, I think it's from, you know, Ban. I hope I am pronouncing the name correctly. Boom. Would you like to ask your question yourself? Um, uh, if you could just unmute yourself. Hi. Um, so evening to start off. So I come from Zimbabwe and I'm yeah. very familiar with how African governments tend to act when it comes to taking responsibility. I just wanted to ask from a general standpoint, do you think that these governments will ever take, you know, adequate responsibility for their lack of efficient governance or is it up to us as like the African youth to fix their mistakes? <clears throat> Thank you, Kim. That's Kim, correct? Um, so, you know, let me give you an example of uh, Paul Bia of Cameroon. He's been the president of Cameroon since the 1980s. Over 40 years. Mm -hmm. He's over eight years old, you know. And he does not even live in Cameroon. He lives in Switzerland, if I'm not mistaken. And he calls the shots from there. And there are many others like him who have no commitment whatsoever, you know, to or their local populations, to their countries, to their people, the young people. They look at young people as, you know, a security threat. But in reality, these governments that are unaccountable to their citizens, corrupt most of the time, uh, mismanagement and embezzlement and embezzlement of uh, public funds. These are the ones that constitute a threat to human security. Many of these leaders are part of that generation 
of the fight for liberation. They have lived their lives. They've enjoyed their lives. But apparently that's not enough. They will continue as long as they can. And the people who have a stake in the future are young people. Conventionally, the, the future belongs to young people, but that's not the case in Africa. So unless young people take the responsibility into their own hands and seek to hold these governments accountable, young people in Africa will continue to have no future. Many of them will continue to risk their lives crossing the Sahara Desert risk their lives trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea to get into Europe because of hopelessness in the continent. It's in the, it's in the responsibility and in the best interest of young people to take action, to mobilize each other, to organize themselves. Otherwise, this will not happen, you know. Uh, accountability will not happen. And remember, the people who are in charge of these governments right now were young people back during the liberation struggle. They were the ones who fought for the liberation of these countries. And it's up to the young people right now to fight for the second liberation of these countries, or else there will be no future. So young people, organize yourselves, put pressure on governments, build alliances. This is your home, Africa. And this is where your future lies. Just to go into something you said um, earlier um, before answering this question, also during this question, um, you talked about uh, Paul Bia, the president of uh, Cameroon. Um, and I just wanted to quickly um, move the um, discussion back to uh, Islamic State, if you will. So I'm currently sharing my screen and here you can see uh, something which I'd hope to address during the main lecture uh, with the uh, other speaker, which is mm -hmm. the, the general trend of um, insurgencies over the last 10 years or so. Um, as you can see, there's an uptick since 2011. Uh, in Cameroon, there's also um, insurgency being fought, not Islamic, but uh, separatist by language. Um, and the leaders for that group uh, are also uh, Ayabo Cholukas. He's also currently uh, leading it from Norway, um, also from abroad. But they essentially started their getting arms around the same period that uh, people in Mozambique started getting arms and funding um, through, I guess, the corridor from Libya um, or via the eastern coast. So wouldn't you say that there is a general trend in um, extremist violence, which is related to outside forces? Of course, there is the internal grievances to exploit, and there is valid uh, issues which people have with their governments, which are causing them to raise up. But isn't there still this um, international connection caused by arms trafficking um, in recent years? So if you look at Mozambique, for example, um, <clears throat> you know, it's not only violent extremism that has been happening here. You also see an international trade and trafficking in drugs and it's still not yet clear whether and if and how the profits or the revenues from this trade um, are being used to finance you know the violent extremism in northern Mozambique. Now these trade routes have existed for centuries and now they are being exploited by drug traffickers as they face uh, stiff uh, security challenges in the Mediterranean. Now they are diverting their trafficking 
through the Mozambican Channel, the Swahili coast, all the way down to South Africa. They enter the African continent through the long coast of Mozambique, which is predominantly just open and policed and controlled. And the drugs go all the way down by road to South Africa. And from here, they go to lucrative markets in Europe. Along the way, you know, some drugs are left here. And it's, it is estimated that in Mozambique, this drug trafficking um, injects about 100 million US dollars per year. That's a lot of money for a country like Mozambique. And no one knows uh, where that money goes, where it ends up. And it's possible that some of this money could be used uh, for, you know, purchasing of arms and financing the operations of these um, uh, armed groups. We also know that illegal exploitation of natural resources in that area has been going on for at least 10 years. Illegal logging, uh, animal poaching, and, uh, you know, the trading in you know wildlife so you have this trade of um, uh, wildlife products and um, logs to asian markets especially china and these trade brings a lot of money which you know ends up in shady places you don't know where it ends up it's possible that some of these funds are used to finance the operations of violent extremism in the area. So there's a lot of interconnections, um, transnational inter interconnections, because uh, these networks do not, you know, are not bound by bounded states. They are not bound or limited by frontiers, by borders. They operate more like rhizome, rhizomes and they spread and the governments are still you know, struggling to understand these rhizomes, these networks. And they are still operating in bounded manners. They are still operating on the basis of the old of the old idea of sovereignty, so these governments are not collaborating and working together to ensure that they share information and many other resources required to understand the movements and the nature of these networks and to control them. You know, I think these processes are also taking place in the countries that you have mentioned. So the connections are not only virtual connections in which one group pledges allegiance to ISIS, and then ISIS publishes uh, their activities, uh, their exploits and so on. But we have seen in the case of Mozambique that there are networks of you know, trading in contraband goods that are used to finance these operations. And I would not be surprised to see that happening in the countries that you have mentioned. In fact, in Nigeria, there are reports that that is happening. And so, you know, these are patterns that we see, you know, happening all over the continent and in connection with this violent extremism that is taking place in these countries. Mm. No, it's, there's a um, somewhat uh, related question which has come in from the YouTube comments, um, after which I'm going to hand over uh, the word again to our audience members since I've got some other so very interesting questions come in. Uh, but first of all, Saskia asked uh, whether there, you think there is a link between these problems and the West, for example, uh, corrupt 
dictators being backed by uh, politically by former colonial powers? Um, so when I look at these issues, uh, I see the aid issue as one of the direct links to Western countries, you know, between these governments that are corrupt and accountable uh, via the, you know, politics of aid. Because what aid does, unfortunately, you know, one of those unintended consequences of aid is that it makes corrupt governments unaccountable to their people because the governments know that they don't have to rely on tax paying citizens who demand accountability on how their taxes are used because these governments know that they will get aid anyway from donor countries and they have no need to be accountable to uh, to their people, to their constituencies, to their electorate, you know? And they do not even answer to, to donor countries because what we have seen so far is that donor countries are interested in just putting aid in these countries, you know, as much as possible, you know, and, um, it's part of you know, an industry that would like to uh, perpetuate itself. And so the aid continues to flow despite you know, the, the unintended consequences that it has. So in my view, the connection between Western governments and these corrupt governments here in Africa is through aid, which funds them makes it possible for them to continue in power despite their corruption, despite their illegitimacy in the eyes of, it, of, of their people. And um, this is what we have seen and Mozambique is a perfect case. Mozambique has been called um, a donor darling. If you read uh, Joseph Harlan, you know, writings, you will find all of these things that I'm referring to and he's been analyzing this situation, the relationship between you know, donor funds and the state and its corruption in Mozambique. And that is precisely what's happening. In my view, that's the connection. Now, with the fight against violent extremism, we also see aid flowing to governments in order to aid them to fight violent extremism to fight ISIS, to fight terrorism. You know, that is the terminology they use. And these governments are motivated by aid to use this discourse, these terminologies, terrorists, uh, ISIS, Islamic extremism, so that they can, they can you know, attract aid from Western donors. And this is what we have seen. It's continuing and Mozambique is doing that hoping to attract aid and they've gone to the EU to ask you know for aid to fight Islamic extremism in Mozambique you know. by testing my microphone hello yes um yes. I'll also awesome. ask a question um would you mind turning on your camera uh, uh, camera one second please one second um, I also have a somewhat related question to what uh, Boom will be asking shortly, which is from Kim, uh, yeah. who asked also a somewhat uh, controversial question, which is whether uh, extremism might be better uh, for people in the regions uh, where extremist group rules. Is, is the structure that these non-governmental armed groups mm -hmm. provide better than what the government has provided previously? Um, and I'd like to combine that question uh, with what oh, you God, ask. If your camera doesn't work, that's okay too. Yeah, one second, I'm fixing it right now. Um, in that case. 
So shall I respond? Yes, it's there, working on you know, it. I am, um, you know, these terms that we use, especially violent extremism, terrorism, insurgents, uh, have to be looked at, you know, with some level of skepticism and, uh, um, you know, a critical eye. Because you may remember that people like Nelson Mandela, for example, and others who fought for liberation of this continent were labeled by the regimes of the day as terrorists, as, you know, violent extremists who sought to target legitimate governments and um, innocent civilians. Uh, I remember even the organization even the organization that I work for, Amnesty International, uh, refused to advocate for Nelson Mandela because he was supposedly, you know, um, a terrorist, as he was labeled by the British government at the time. So let us look at these terms from that perspective, a critical perspective, um, a perspective of skepticism, and let us see if we can deconstruct them so that uh, perhaps, you know, we can, you know, uh, open, you know, new understandings of what's happening in these countries. Because we cannot simply absorb and be an echo chamber of the discourse espoused by these governments, whether it's African governments, corrupt governments seeking to maintain themselves in power, whether it's Western governments seeking to provide aid uh, to these corrupt governments, whether it's Western governments seeking to provide aid to these governments in order to protect Western multinational corporations extracting resources at the expense of local people. That's my look at and my, my perspective on this. So Boom's question was somewhat related to your perspective. Yes. Okay. So, of course, you know, when you talk about extremism and how they are able to act so effectively because the government effectively has such a convincing push factors for the people, the pull factor becomes very, you know, attractive. Like, in layman's terms, let's say uh, someone pays me 50 euros of the same faith as me, but more extreme, pays me 50 euros, tells me, oh, get your friends, go get some weapons, we're going to you know, cause some trouble. Nobody here is in Europe, hopefully anyway, is going to take that offer because there's no push factor for that. You go to you know, Mozambique, that's a different story, like you said, sir. So now my question is, uh, you know, ethical concerns aside, you know, would what, what would make it not feasible to exploit these same, you know, politics of, you know, extremism and social economics of extremism in our favor to, you know, liberate Africa the second time, like you said, your words. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think the use of the word extremism is very selective. Yes. Because we seem to believe that it's only applicable when it, when it refers to, or when we are speaking about the other, mm -hmm. um, the Islamist, mm -hmm. you know, the religious extremist or fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. However, when it comes to politics of extremism, as we have seen in Mozambique, for example, and in many other countries, where the entire state or the entire nation state is really not distinguishable from the party, the ruling party, mm -hmm. where the entire public service is partisized. In other words, you can't even distinguish between the ruling party mm -hmm. and the public service. Mm -hmm. Those are politics of extremism. So why don't we Mm -hmm. recognize this as political extremism. True. Why, mm -hmm. why do we only use the term political extremism when we speak about, um, you know? Faith. 
Yes, sir. Are, are that groups of faith groups or religious groups mm -hmm. who express their grievances in a way mm -hmm. that we ourselves do not agree with? Yes, sir. Secondly, secondly, we also have social economics of extremism, which I was talking about, mm -hmm. whereby you have people in certain regions that are extremely rich. In fact, that's where the wealth of the country is concentrated. Yet at the same time, mm -hmm. these are the regions that are the poorest, mm -hmm. that are excluded mm -hmm. from the economics, from the labor market, mm -hmm. from the politics. That's where you see um, extremely poor uh, human development indicators, mm -hmm. education and so on. So when a government is absent in this area, it creates extreme conditions of poverty, of exclusion, yet we tend not to see these, you know, as extremism. Mm -hmm. We see persecution of people mm -hmm. who hold views that are, are unorthodox and mm -hmm. we don't see that and we don't categorize that as violent extre extremism. So mm -hmm. I think we need to you know, shift a little bit you know, our framing mm -hmm. of these issues mm -hmm. and deconstruct you know, the idea of you know, extremism. extremism. Mm -hmm. What is it? when is it ap applicable, under what conditions? Mm -hmm. Is it only applicable when it's religious groups involved in uh, expression of their, <clears throat> their grievances and so on? Mm -hmm. That would be my response to your question. <clears throat> yes, sir, I uh, fully concur. And honestly, what you say here, like, you know, I guess a more broader term is, you know, governmental tyranny. Maybe we should, in fact, do consider it as, you know, a form of extremism maybe, maybe, you know, they're more interchangeable than we might previously assume otherwise. And just to add to what you've just said, yes, sir. we also tend to use the word radicalization when it's the Islamic preacher, okay? Mm, true, true. Or the religious preacher who comes and, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. spread an orthodox views of the social world or the political world and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. radical, radicalization is the change of people from the root, mm -hmm. from the core. Mm -hmm. And it's not only Islamic preachers who do that. Mm -hmm. Politics yes. of extremism, the politics of, of extremism do that. Mm -hmm. the economics of exclusion mm -hmm. also do that. Mm -hmm. When the land on which people have depended for centuries in order for them to provide mm -hmm. food, housing, mm -hmm. water, health, mm -hmm. even education mm -hmm. is removed from under their feet, then life is not worth living anymore. Mm -hmm. That radicalizes people, that angers yes. people, that changes people from the core. In fact, um, a friend of mine who has been living in um, in the United States for more than 20 years now mm -hmm. decided last year that he would visit, um, uh, you know, his birthplace, mm -hmm. Nampula. Nampula is another province just next to Cabo Delgado. Mm -hmm. And he went there when he arrived. He gave me a call and the man was crying on the phone. Mm -hmm. He's crying. And I'm surprised, man, a grown-up a grown man like you, you know, a man, you know, these masculinity men don't cry. And so, so what's going on? And the man is crying. And when I asked him what's going on, he, he says to me, <clears throat> I no longer recognize the place where I was born. Mm -hmm. It has been completely transformed. You know, the places, the spaces, the trees, the forests, mm -hmm lakes, the rivers that, you know, make up my identity are no more accessible to my people. The forests have disappeared. They are not there anymore. 
and I see my people working for pittance, destroying their own forests, logging illegally, and working like slaves. Now, this man is crying and is telling me all of these things and try to imagine you know, what sense of shock at his core within himself that he went through when he saw this. Uh, if this is not radicalization, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it is, you know? So I think uh, we need also to interrogate the idea of radicalization and seek to understand what it means in different contexts, in different political and social contexts. It's not only, not only in the context of religio religiosity and expression of grievances in ways that we do not agree with. Mm -hmm. Interesting perspective, yeah, for sure. Um, I think that's probably the way that it is across the world, really. Um, boom, I hope your thank questions you. were answered. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. Very uh, insightful. You're welcome. That's much appreciated. And thank you for those questions. Um, since you were just talking about uh, Gabo Delgado and uh, Mozambique in particular, I thought it'd be a good idea to bring it back uh, to your area of expertise in the case at hand. Um, Eric had a somewhat related question. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, first, so many thanks, uh, David, for your special presentation. My name is Eric Sassende, and I'm currently a PhD student here at, uh, at the Department of International Relations here at the University of Groningen. And I do my research on Mozambique, mainly on, on the extractive industries in, uh, in the province of Tete, looking at the violence engagement, the coal extraction, and I had the privilege of doing field work there uh, last year. So your, your talk was very insi insi insightful in this regard. As well, it was Mozambique. Uh, a lot of the dynamics that you highlighted that they were just starting or a lot of the information was coming out. So in this sense, I have basically two questions. One external, concerning the external uh, environment and one internal. So on the external one, um, would you have any information on on uh, discussions about external interventions? Because I heard, especially through Josef Hanlon, that there were talks uh, with the EU, with the with the UN, uh, to consider a peacekeeping operation in Mozambique. And and besides that, there were uh, I think there were actual employments and deployments of Russian mercenaries and. Uh, and South African private security firms in Cabo Delgado. Would you have anything to say about that? Did, did those engagements help, or did they only uh, make did they only make the problem worse? And my second and last question concerns uh, internal political dynamics in in Mozambique. As you as you mentioned, it's the first time that Mozambique is faced with with a religious. Uh, extremism and with a religious kind of violence. Uh, before that, uh, it used to be mainly with the opposition party Renamo. Uh, and my question is in that sense: uh, Do you do you find links between uh, the opposition parties, uh, like for instance Renamo and MDM, with with the insurgency? Like, can can there be connections between these stakeholders? That being said, many thanks, and uh, again, really enjoyed your presentation. So to summarize, um, first question being, do you see any usefulness or any potential for external military invention from EU, NATO, or regional powers? Uh, or alternative to, alternatively, private military companies from Russia or South Africa? And secondly, whether it's a link between insurgents and opposition streams in the political atmosphere of Mozambique. Okay, thank you. Um, let me start with the last one. <clears throat> so when you look at um, the Mozambican politics in, uh, if you look at Mozambican politics, you'll see 
that there are regional divides. You have Southern region, which is closer to South Africa, and you have the Central region, which is closer to Zimbabwe. In fact, Tete, where you, conduct your, where you conducted your research, is considered part of Central Mozambique, even though it's, it's way West. And then you have the Northern region, and you know the politics of Mozambique. You know these regional politics cannot be separated by cannot 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 be divorced from economics, from politics of natural resources, and from you know differences in human development. Um, uh, indicators. First of all, these are the areas where you have, you know, strongholds of the oppositions, Central and Northern Mozambique. The opposition, Renamo in particular, and of latest, you also have the MDM. Uh, these are strongholds of the opposition. The ruling party in Mozambique has been weak to a great extent since independence in these areas. At the same time, this is where you see the highest concentration of natural resources. The mineral wealth is concentrated in these areas. And this is where you have uh, strong stronghold of the opposition. At the same time, demographically, this is where you see you know, the concentration or the majority of the population concentrated. So central and northern Mozambique, the population is huge there. The largest bulk of the population is based here. At the same time, this is where you see poor human development uh, indicators. And, you know, these politics, these economics, and uh, this uprising that you see happening are actually interwoven together, that you cannot really disentangle them in a meaningful way. You have to see them as a whole host of entangled you know, factors that reinforce each other and produce you know, the kind of you know, the, the grievances that we have at the moment. In the areas where this violent is taking this violence is taking place, the opposition is very strong and it has won in the last elections and in many other you know elections you know previously, handily, you know. And so you know there are people who speculate within you know the, the Mozambican political elite, you know, that perhaps these you know, a part of uh, Renam or Renam has something to do with it. Uh, but in reality, really, it's the grievance, the grievances that we have seen of exclusion, of inequality, that find their expression on the ballot box, you know, that find the expression politically. That's what I could say about you know, your second questions, I think, with regard to, um, you know, the relationship between the opposition, uh, you know, the, the government or the governing party and what we see happening, uh, the insurgencies, this, the insurgents, you know, uh, conducting attacks in Northern Mozambique. Now, with regard to your first question <clears throat> about, um, uh, external intervention. Uh, last year, there were Russian mercenaries. Mm -hmm. They came in and they did what they could and they decided you know, to leave. Under what circumstances, I really don't know, but uh, they were not successful in whatever objectives they wanted to achieve and they left and they were substituted by, 
you know, mercenaries from South Africa and Zimbabwe, although they are based in South Africa. So we have these external interventions happening, but these are private armies that have been recruited by the Mozambican government without the authorization of the Mozambican people, without negotiating with anyone, not even in parliament, the executive, or rather the office of the president simply decided to bring these mercenaries. We don't know what agreements have been signed between the government and the, and the mercenaries to provide you know, these services. Yet we know it's the Mozambican taxpayers funds that are funding these mercenaries. We also know that these mercenaries really are not accountable to anyone because it's the responsibility of the Mozambican governments under the international human rights law to protect the human rights of its citizens. Now, when you have these mercenaries that are not accountable to anyone, they are not signatory to any international human rights instruments, then you can expect a, a lot of atrocities committed by these mercenaries without any measures of accountability whatsoever put in place um, in order to bring those responsible for violating human rights to justice. That's a serious problem. We also know that the Mozambican government has approached the EU for support, for aid. And it seems as if uh, the, 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 the EU is going to supply aid in what form, I don't know. I think the United States as well has shown some interest um, in supplying aid, probably training the military or supplying armaments, who knows? Because these agreements are not made public. They are not accessible to the Mozambican public. I don't know whether the publics in the, in the US and in the in the EU have access to these agreements. So that's what I can say, and we do not know much because these governments are not accountable, they are not transparent. Uh, we really have no access to this, to these documents, to these agreements. I think a lack of transparency and shady dealings, which the public isn't aware of and the usage of public tax money for whatever the political establishment says is a common issue across the region. Um, I, Eric, I hope those answered your questions. I certainly think they did, <laughs> to my knowledge. Um, we have one final question, um, after which I want to ask you something else as a closing remark. Um, Eric said it did answer his question, so uh, thank you very much. Um, Sebastian wants to ask also about uh, the role of foreign uh, militaries in the region. Uh, Sebastian, could you ask your question yourself? Um, yes. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, we can see um, some military support from powers such as France in uh, Africa to help fight with um, insurrections like that. Um, do you think there's a way for you know us Europeans to petition our governments to try to address the grievances uh, as well as sending military support, uh, considering that seems to be within the European Union uh, more and more of a concern, the stability of Africa. Thank you. It's a very important question. Um, I think our governments, our governments, whether the African governments whether they are EU-based governments or, you know, governments based in the, in the Americas, they, they ought to be held accountable. We cannot allow our governments to simply conduct themselves, you know, in ways that violates the international human rights instruments, the international law to which you know, they are state parties. We cannot allow that. I think one of the things that, um, you know, the citizens in Western countries 
especially those that uh, provide military aid or send their troops to fight, I think they should seek to build alliances with civil society organizations that monitor these situations, that monitor the actions of their governments and governments that come in with aid, uh, humanitarian aid and military aid to seek to keep you know, these governments in power. I think alliances should be built so that uh, we are able internationally, all of us, to keep these governments accountable. This has been happening with multinational corporations, for example, that come from Western countries and they go to countries of the, the global South uh, to conduct all kinds of um, uh, resources of extractions without respect you know, of human rights, without respect of human dignity, without respect of the laws of those countries. So basically extracting natural resources, leaving almost nothing for local people. Now imagine, but they also leave behind wastelands, polluted, uh, you know, waterways, rivers and lakes, forests, polluted air. And, you know, they privatize the benefits and they socialize, um, you know, the, the problems they create. Now, what has been happening in response to that is, you know, civil society organizations in the global south, in the global north, are building alliances in order to hold, you know, these multinational corporations accountable here in the global south and in the global north where they come from. Uh, I have seen actions to litigate against some of these companies so that you know people who have been harmed by the arms uh, by the activities of these companies get to get some sense of justice some remedies and some of these have happened in the courts of western countries or the global north where these multinational corporations came from i think the same thing can be done in order to hold western governments who provide aid here both humanitarian and military aid uh you know that's what i can say at the moment but i think uh what can be done is simply limited by imagination and i think it's you know up to um citizens of the world you know to think together uh, to find ways creative ways effective ways of holding our governments and these multinational corporations accountable everywhere in the world thank you yeah thank you so much um sebastian i think that answered your question if i'm correct uh that certainly answered my question perfectly thank you very much yeah thank you very much for uh, answering all these questions you've definitely given me personally some food for this and i think the same goes for the rest of our audience um since we have got two minutes left officially according to the schedule um i just wanted to ask you finally for uh, some closing remarks you have been on the ground yourself. You've met people, civilians, um, who, and those who Western and media and governments would call radicals. Um, what, what, what do they seek to gain from their current situation? What do they need to improve their lives? Um, if we're going to tie it back to the United Nations or to what you were just saying, what, what should we try and struggle for to try and improve their situation? Um, and do you have any experiences or direct uh, memories or which would be interesting to share on that front. So for immediate remedies, people that uh, things that people need right now is humanitarian aid. And if you want to learn more about um, 
the situation of internally displaced people in Cabo Delgado, you can follow the work of the Catholic Bishop of Pemba, uh, Don Lisboa. You know, he speaks about, you know, the reality, the problems, as he, he's, he witnesses them on the ground. You know, the church and he himself every day receive people who have been traumatized, who have seen their family members beheaded, raped, you know, and so on. These are traumatized people. So he will give you the information firsthand. Just Google and, you know, the Bishop of Pemba, uh, Luis uh, Lisboa, and you will find a lot of information about him and, uh, you know, the updates that he's been giving. So according to him, and also the people that we've been speaking with on the ground, humanitarian assistance is of critical importance at the moment. We are talking about food. We're talking about medicine. We're talking about shelter. Uh, those are very you know, critical issues because you find that, for example, in Pemba, a household of four or five people now houses 50 people, you know, that have come in fleeing from uh, the attacks in the north. That tells you the kind of precarity in which they live. Sanitation is a problem. Water is a problem. Health is a problem. Food is a problem, you know. So we need to address those things immediately. So if you are able, you know, to lobby whoever, whether it's civil, or civil society organizations or intergovernmental organizations over there, those are the critical issues that the international community could address immediately. I think I will end with that. Thank you. Um, just finally, is there anywhere we could donate if um, we want to directly try and support uh, their efforts? Well, uh, I will give you, I will send you the information uh, of the Caritas organization. Caritas organization is run by you know, the Catholic church that is dealing with this problem in the city of Pemba where they have thousands and thousands of people. And I think they could use, you know, any assistance um, possible. Right. So I will send you that information and uh, you will distribute it through your networks. Absolutely, yes. Well, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I hope that some people here will be moved to help. Um, and thank you so much for informing us because just being aware of the current state of affairs is also very important, um, especially seeing as we here are future decision makers and future and current voters who have an influence in government. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your lecture. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it myself personally. I thank you so much for asking your questions. As I said, it was certainly food for thought. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for your interest and for the invitation. Absolutely. And yeah, with that, um, we'll end the event here. Um, and round of applause, of course, although it wouldn't be the same as if you're in the room. Um, Absolutely.